glad that you're here. And today what we're doing is, is continuing the series that we started four weeks ago. We're in the fifth week this week of this series that we're calling Not a Fan, Not a Fan. And in this series, what we're doing is, is really unpacking this question, am I a fan or am I a follower? Am I, am I just a fan of Jesus or am I a follower of Jesus? And we have defined a fan as one who is an enthusiastic admirer. And so when Jesus called people to follow him, he didn't call people just to admire him from a distance, but he wanted them to follow him. And that meant to be close to him. That meant to be a disciple of his, to be a student of his, to be a follower. And so the question is, am I a fan or am I just a follower? Now, in this series, what I hope we've made clear is that Jesus loves fans. In fact, he loves fans as much as he loves followers. But Jesus doesn't want you just to stay a fan. Jesus wants you to grow and to deepen and to mature and, and to become a fully devoted, totally committed follower of his. And so what we're talking about in the series today is the comfortable cross, the comfortable cross. Now, let me ask you a question. How important is a brand or a logo or a slogan to a company or to a cause? How important is it? It's very important, isn't it? It's very important because the brand or the logo or the slogan is going to be something that generally speaking is appealing and holds some kind of an attraction that draws you to it. For example, if I were to give a slogan for a product or a company, my guess is you'd be able to tell me what product it was or what company it was. For example, if I were to say, for instance, Melts in your mouth, not in your hands. M&Ms, right? Okay, if I were to say the ultimate driving machine, BMW, okay? If I were to say, just do it, Nike. If I were to say, you're in good hands with. If I were to say, like a good neighbor, State farmers, you see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? You, you know that because these companies have invested a lot of time and a lot of energy to come up with just the right phraseology to get you to buy their product, to buy into their product. Now, what would be the slogan or what would be the, the brand, the logo that followers of Jesus would have? I suggest to you that it's in the memory verse that, that we've been looking at throughout this entire series. And I want you to read it with me. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Let's read this with a lot of enthusiasm. Here we go. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now, the slogan for followers of Jesus could be accurately captured in this way. Come and die with me. Come and die with me. Now, can we just be real honest? Is that, is that really very attractive? I mean, that's not very appealing, is it? I mean, it's not very friendly. I mean, couldn't, couldn't Jesus have maybe thought of something else? Because I don't think people are going to flock to this. In fact, not only will they not flock to it, they'll flee from it. I mean, couldn't you come up with something a little bit better? Like, you know, you're in, you're in good hands with Jesus. Or like a good neighbor, Jesus is there. Isn't that better? Isn't that more appealing? But no, come and die with me. And, and, then, and then take the symbol, the, the logo of those of us who follow Jesus. What's the logo? It's the cross, right? It's the cross. I mean, it makes you wonder, who was Jesus' marketing strategist, you know, to, to come up with, with this? I mean, at least it gets your attention, but, but the cross? I mean, were, could there not have been other things that Jesus could have chosen to be like the logo for those who follow him? I mean, what about a dove? A dove would be better than a cross. At, at least a dove is like a symbol of peace or maybe even a shepherd's staff. That could be a symbol of protection 
or even a rainbow for that matter. That's the symbol of hope. But no, no, what do we, we get stuck with a cross, okay? I mean, why choose two bloody beams nailed together? Why? I mean, why, why that? I mean, so, so given the boss says that this is our slogan and this is our logo, we've made the best of it, right? Haven't we? We've made the best of it. I guess if a cross is a logo, you make the best of it. I mean, we have. We lit the things and we put them on either side of the stage. And so they look really attractive and, and, and really pretty. And so, so we make the best of it. We, we've made the best of them around our house. I, I grabbed one off the wall. I didn't ask my wife's permission, but I, I snuck this off the wall at our house. And we've made the best of the cross. I mean, we've got a nice decorative one here. I mean, it's all pretty. That's a, that's a nice looking cross, isn't it? I think so. I think it's a nice looking cross. And so we've turned it into jewelry. We've turned it into t-shirts. We've turned it into tattoos and, and we've made the best of, of the cross. But for the people who heard Jesus say this for the first time, take up your cross and follow me to them. This was repulsive. This, this, was, this was, was offensive to them because for the Jews, the cross was a means of execution. It was a means of execution, and it wasn't uncommon for Jews to even revolt against the Roman oppression. And in, and in order for the Romans to squelch the Jews, they would crucify them. And, and we've been told as many as 2,000 at one time. Line them along the roadway and crucify them. So, so to the people in that century and to the Jews, the cross was something that was, was very offensive. In fact, the cross was a symbol of humiliation. That's what the cross was. It was a symbol of humiliation because the Jews had many different ways they could have killed people. I mean, they could have stoned them. They could have burned them. They could have run a spear through them. They could have taken a sword and chopped off their head. There's a lot of different ways they could have killed people, but oftentimes they chose the cross. And typically when they chose the cross, one of the reasons they chose it was because they wanted to humiliate the victim. They wanted to humiliate the person who was being crucified. And so to the Jews, the cross was a symbol of humiliation. Not only that, but it was a symbol of suffering. Because whenever a person was crucified, it's typical that they would be beaten first. And typically beyond recognition. And then after they were beaten, they were compelled to carry their own cross, which really was the cross beam that weighed somewhere in the vicinity of about 125 pounds. And so they would have to carry this 125 pound cross beam across their shoulders as it dug into and, and ground into their open bleeding sores where they had been beaten. And so you can't carry a cross without suffering. There's no comfortable way to carry a cross. And even though there are teachings out there today, uh, false teachings th that, that say things like, well, you know, if, what, if you're a follower of Jesus then, uh, and you're having difficulties, then you must, really, must not really be following him because, because as a follower of Jesus, you shouldn't have to put up with that. And that's just simply not true. I mean, there are, there's more than one scripture that, that, um, that does more than just hint at the fact that when we choose to follow Jesus, we... We invite a certain measure of suffering into our life. In fact, one of those is Luke chapter 6, where the Bible says, What happiness it is when others hate you and exclude you. I mean, how many of you like to be excluded? Nobody does. And when they insult you and they smear your name because you're mine. <laughs> I mean, how, how, I'm, <laughs> yippee, I'm happy. <laughs> You know, that this happens. Or so 2 Timothy, everyone who, who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be what? Help me out here. Will be persecuted. And so the question that I'm faced with, and maybe you're faced with it too, I don't know, is this. When is the last time following Jesus cost me anything? When is the last time following Jesus really cost me anything? When is the last time following Jesus cost me a relationship? When has it cost me a promotion? When has it cost me a raise? When has it cost me a financial sacrifice? When has it cost me a vacation? And, and so following Jesus invites a certain amount of suffering. And the cross was a symbol of suffering. It was a symbol of humiliation. But obviously, the cross was a symbol of death. Make no mistake about it. When Jesus invited us to follow him, he invited us to die. 
He invited us, he, he bid us to die to ourselves. He said to take up your cross and die to yourself. Now here's the deal. A decision to follow Jesus is a decision to die to yourself. That's what it means to follow Jesus. It's a decision to die to yourself. Now contrast the symbol of the cross with our love for comfort. Just contrast that just a moment. Contrast the symbol of the cross, a humiliation and suffering and death with our desire for comfort. I mean, let's face it. Most of us commit a good portion of our time and our resources to live comfortably, don't we? We do because we're naturally comfort seekers, not cross bearers. Most of us would far rather be comfortable than carry a cross. By nature, we're comfort seekers. I mean, because we're people of the lazy boy, right? I mean, we're people of the day spa. We're, we're people of the country club, aren't we? I mean, we're people of the snuggie, okay? How many of you have a snuggie? Raise your hand. Oh, come on. Come on, raise it up high. Be proud. Be proud that you have, I have a snuggie. In fact, I brought my snuggie with me. Here's my snuggie right here. In fact, I'm going to put my snuggie on because I just feel the need for comfort. I mean, what is a snuggie in the first place? My gosh, if I can even figure this thing out. What, what is a snuggie? It's basically a blanket with sleeves. And it's great. How many of you are jealous right now? <laughs> Somebody said, you really look like a monk when you wear this. <laughs> I think I do too, actually. I think I missed my call. <laughs> I, I, I think I missed my calling, you know? I mean, a Snuggie, what is it? It's a, it's a, it's a blanket with sleeves. Not only is it a blanket with sleeves, you know what a Snuggie is? It's a glorified hospital robe. <laughs> That's, that's what it is. And I'm all hung up in my Snuggie. I think I'm going to preach in my Snuggie. I just, I kind of like it. I feel comfortable. Right about now. Here's the problem. Here's the problem that we face in our society and the culture in which we live today. We love being comfortable. And if we're not careful, what we'll settle for is a comfortable Christianity. We'll settle for a comfortable faith. I mean, honestly, we, we do everything we can to make you comfortable when you come here, okay? I mean, short of giving everyone a Snuggie, we, we provide you a, a nice comfortable building. It's, it's a comfortable environment. You have comfortable coffee that you can bring in here. You have comfortable chairs that you can sit in. You have comfortable service times. You know, you can sleep in on Sunday morning, you know, and have a nice comfortable morning, have a brunch and watch football. And, and then when you get around to it, you can come to church at night. It's, it's just comfortable. It's just comfortable. But if we're not careful, what we'll do is, is if we're not careful, we'll say, you know, that whole series about not a fan and, and being a follower and, you know, denying myself, that is just not very comfortable to me. I think I'm going to take a break, you know, from, from this series. And, and, and then if we're not careful, not only will we want a comfortable message, we'll say, L listen, let's just go all the way. Let's just have a comfortable cross. I mean, I guess if Jesus says you got to bear a cross, well, let's make it as comfortable as possible. And this thing is hot. I got to tell you, <laughs> would anybody care to borrow my Snuggie for the rest of the service? Would you? I'm not giving this to you. Okay, I'm not that gracious. We're not in generous people yet. That's the next series. That's how you put it on. There you go. Don't lose your mind. <laughs> you look so comfortable down there. So I guess you could call it a snuggy theology. 
And, and there are churches. I mean, there's lots of churches around today that I think have settled for what you could almost call a snuggy theology in that, you know, we just have to see how comfortable we can make people. Because we don't want to offend people. We don't want to drive people away. After all, if we have to have a logo that says, come and follow me, and I mean, die with me, and, and a cross, let's at least try to make the message comfortable. Can I just say something to you? We're never going to make the message comfortable around here. And the cross was never intended to be comfortable. And, and even though there, there are lots of churches in, 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 around the world, and, and some right here in the United States that, yes, they preach from the Bible, but I'm not sure they preach all of the Bible and they leave out some parts because some parts, honestly, are just uncomfortable. They can almost be embarrassing to teach. I mean, stop and think about it. If it were a car ad, it would sound something like this. If, if you had a car, and this actually was an ad in an advertisement in a paper. It says, it says, this car runs okay and the tires are pretty new. But that's about it. It has no radio. The acceleration is sluggish, the clutch is sticky, and its gas mileage is probably no better than 10 to 15 miles per gallon. In general, it's an American car, made during the time when American cars weren't built very well. And so the $500 price quoted is just because all of my friends tell me that a running car must be worth at least $500, so I suppose I'll bargain with you to the lower price. And that was the ad. So you could take that message and, and even make it sound more appealing. For example, it might sound something like this. With nearly new tires, this car really holds the road and empty space is available allowing you to put in the stereo system of your choice. With acceleration like this, you won't ever have to worry about getting pulled over. When, when you buy this American-made car, you're supporting our country and the freedom we enjoy. We'll sacrifice for $499.99. I mean, you can take anything that's, that sounds negative and make it sound good. And if we're going to be totally honest, there really isn't a whole lot of, of very comfortable language in Jesus' bid to follow him. Because he says, listen, if you're going to follow me, it means you're going to have to deny yourself daily and take up your cross and follow me. And so when you get right down to the bottom line, and we're coming really pretty close to the end of this, this series, I have one more message. And so when you kind of get right down to the bottom line, the decision to follow Jesus means this. We have to choose death. We have to choose death. In order to follow Jesus, we have to choose death. Now, because I'm a pastor, I'm around dead people all the time. Okay? And I don't mean you. <laughs> okay? But I'm around dead people all the time. I've, I've been to more funerals, and I've stood by many a casket, and I've watched lots of people file by loved ones and pay their final respect. And, and I don't mean any disrespect to dead people. Okay? So I hope I'm not offending anybody. I don't mean any disrespect to dead people because all of us are going to be one one of these days. But I've noticed something about dead people. Dead people really could care less about what you think of them. I've just noticed that. I've, I've watched them. as I, I look at them and think, they, they don't care. They could care less of what she thinks. They could care less of what you think about what they, what they have on. They could care less about what you think of their makeup. They could care less of what you think about the casket they're in. They could care less about what you think of the house they lived in. They could care less about what you think of the job they had. They could care less about what you think they had in their bank account. They could care less. They could care less. Now, you might be thinking, so what's the point? <laughs> well, that's a good question. The point is this. Death is the ultimate surrender of yourself and all that you have. Think about it. Death is the ultimate surrender of yourself and all that you have. And that's what Jesus asks us to do, to die. When Jesus calls us to follow him, he says, to take up your cross. Take up your cross. The word take implies that we have a choice. And even that is, is um, not typically how we think of death, right? I mean, we don't think of death as something we choose. Death is something that typically chooses us. We don't choose it. In fact, scientists tell us that we have what's called a survivor instinct. And that when our life is threatened, 
then self-preservation kicks in and we'll go to extreme measures to preserve ourselves. And so when Jesus says to take up your cross and follow me and to die with me, and, and the cross is, is the logo, everything about it is countercultural. And not only is it countercultural, it's counterintuitive because nothing about it makes sense and nothing about it feels right to us. It goes against their survival instinct. But notice that Jesus doesn't just say, take up your cross. He goes even farther. What does he say? He says, take up your cross. Say it out loud. Daily. daily. He says, take up your cross daily. In other words, every day we have to make the choice to die to ourself in order to follow Jesus. Dying to self is not a one-time decision. I don't know if you've discovered that. I mean, I have. But dying to self is not a one-time decision. It's something that happens on a daily basis. Think of your life as a $100 bill, okay? Think of your life as a $100 bill. Most of us think of dying to ourselves as that one big moment when we give to Jesus our life. We give to him our $100 bill. It's, the, it's a one-time decision. Now, don't get me wrong, because that was a big moment. In fact, I would go so far as to say it was the biggest moment of your life. And it will always be the biggest moment of your entire life, the day you gave your life to Jesus. But to see following Jesus as a one-time decision is like a husband on their honeymoon after the wedding saying to his wife, listen, I just stood before 400 people and said, I love you. If I ever change my mind, you'll be the first to know. Okay, there's more to being married than just the marriage ceremony. There's more to being a husband or a spouse than just the marriage ceremony. So instead of thinking of our lives as a $100 bill that we give to Jesus, and that's, that's kind of takes care of it for the rest of the time, think of it more like this way. We, we give to Jesus our $100 bill. We give him our life. And then Jesus turns around and he hands it back to us. And he says, this is what I want you to do. Yes, it is mine, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and cash in your $100 bill into all pennies. And I want you to give me one every day. I belong to you, Jesus, today. 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 Every day, every day, I die to myself. Every day, I choose to follow Jesus. Now, occasionally, someone will say to me, I'm so frustrated with where I am as a follower of Jesus. I, I, I just wish I had grown more. I wish I would have grown more by this point. And so somebody will say something to me like this. I'm going to try every day. Starting with the new year. We're coming up on a new year. I'm going to try every day to be more like Jesus. And can I just say something to you? Chances are you're gonna fail. Chances are you're gonna fail. If, if you say, I'm gonna try every day. And if, if we could just change that word from try to just one word, if we could just change that to where we would say, I'm going to die every day. I'm gonna die every day. Because in order for you and me to truly follow Jesus, that's what it means. It means we have to die every day. These are the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 31. I die daily. And perhaps this is the hardest thing when it comes to being a follower of Jesus. One of the hardest things. It's not, it's, sometimes it's not the hardest thing giving him the $100 bill. Sometimes it's not the hardest thing saying, okay, Jesus, I invite you to be my savior. Sometimes the hardest thing is dying daily to him. Because it comes around so often, okay? But followers of Jesus are willing to do that. And so what I would encourage you to do is, is every day you wake up to, to somehow get into the habit of saying something like this, I choose Jesus today. I choose Jesus today. When you wake up, think to yourself, I choose you today, Jesus. I choose you today, Jesus, over popularity. I choose you today, Jesus, over power. I choose you today, Jesus, over position. I choose you today, Jesus, over money. I choose you today, Jesus, over uh, a romance novel. I choose you today, Jesus, over porn. 
I choose you today, Jesus, over anything that runs the risk of getting in between you and me. I choose you today, Jesus. That's what it means. When Jesus says to come after me, to deny yourself daily, it's just another way of saying, Jesus, today I choose you. I mean, that's the invitation that Jesus gives us in Luke chapter 9. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Listen, if you want to save your life, if you want to live your own life, if you want to do your own thing, Jesus said, go ahead and do it. But what's going to happen is you lose it. You, you, you miss out on so much. But then he goes on. But whoever loses their life for me, or in other words saying, whoever dies to me, for me, will save it. Will save it. And so taking up a cross and, and dying to myself, it sounds like torture. I mean, it sounds like something that is almost unbearable. I mean, if you mean it to, in order to follow Jesus every day, I have to die to myself. That sounds like torture to me. That sounds unbearable. I mean, if that's what it means to follow Jesus, I think I'll take a pass. In fact, that sounds like foolishness to me. <laughs> and in fact, that's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, 18. This is how the world sees the cross and, and, and taking up a cross. In 1 Corinthians 1, for the message of the cross is, is what? What does it say? It's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved. It's the power of God. You see, here's the surprising side effect to dying to self. We discover true life. It's only after we die to ourselves do we truly discover life and the life that we so desperately wanted all along. A life of peace, a life of hope, a life of security, a life of anticipation, a life of security, a life of joy, a life of satisfaction. It's only when we die to ourselves and fully embrace Jesus that we experience the fullness of life. I mean, that's the irony of the whole thing that Jesus says. I mean, let's face it. A lot of God's wisdom sounds like foolishness. It just sounds unreasonable. Again, that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 125. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. And I love this next part. Read it with me. And the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. The weakness of God. Is stronger than man's strength. I mean, stop and think about it. Who else but God could take the cross, a symbol of execution, and turn it into a symbol of life? Who else but God could take the cross, a symbol of shame and humiliation, and turn it into a symbol of grace and forgiveness? Who else but God could take the cross, a symbol of defeat, and turn it into a symbol of victory? That's why we display the cross, because that's what it's come to mean to us. You may not have ever thought about it that way. And what seemed like the ultimate moment of God's weakness when in actuality was his ultimate moment of strength. And here's why that matters. And this is what I don't want you to miss. Write this down. What God did for us on the cross, he can do for me. What God did for the cross, he can do for you. He can do for us. Who else but God can take a person whose life is broken, is marred by sin, is lost, is, 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 uh, is full of guilt and shame and humiliation, who else but God can take a life that's headed in the wrong direction and turn it around and use it for his glory and for his kingdom purposes? Who else but God could do that? The truth is, when you are at your weakest, you are exactly where you need to be for God to be his strongest. Because the upside down truth of the cross is this, that when you are weak, that's when you are strong. In 1 Corinthians 127, Paul says this, but God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things. Notice the wording, God chose the foolish things. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. It's not that God uses the cross in spite of its weakness, okay? Don't miss this. God didn't use the cross in spite of its weakness. God chose the cross because of its weakness. God chose the cross because of his weakness. 
And that's what God can do for us. If you look through scripture, you'll find that over and over and over again, God chose misfits and broken people, people that everybody else would say was weak and used them for his kingdom purposes. Go through the scripture and you'll see it over and over, over and over. Jacob was insecure. Moses stuttered. Samson was proud. Rahab was a prostitute. David had an affair. Jonah was disobedient. Peter was impulsive and hot-tempered. Martha uh, was a worry war. Thomas had paralyzing doubts. I mean, over and over and over in Scripture. The, the Bible is nothing but a long list of imperfect misfits that God chose to carry out his kingdom purposes, to show his strength through weakness. And that's what God can do through you. That's what God wants to do through you. But it won't happen. I'm telling you, it just won't happen if you stay content with where you are. You and I have to choose on a daily basis to follow Jesus. Today, Jesus, I choose you over and you fill in the blank. You fill it in. And if there's something that you cannot choose over Jesus, if there's something that's standing in the way of you and Jesus, then I'm telling you, it's going to be the thing that steals your joy. It's going to steal your peace. It's going to steal your hope. It's going to steal your sense of security. And you're going to find yourself spending more time worrying and being anxious and fearful and doubt. All of those things. And so Jesus says, yeah, my logo is the cross. And, and my slogan is to come and die with me. Because it's in dying with me that you will truly find your life now as we close out today I'm going to ask if you'd bow your head and if you'd close your eyes some of you here today some of you here today need to say Jesus I, I just need to die with you over again yeah yeah you made a you made a decision you you were the hundred dollar bill maybe five years or 50 years ago but to be real honest ever since then maybe once in a while you may be said, okay, today, Jesus, I'll follow you. No, what Jesus is saying, to take up your cross daily. Choose me daily. And maybe the best thing some of you could do today would be to say, today, Jesus, I'm choosing to follow you again. Some of you here uh, have never given your life to Jesus. You've never surrendered your life to Jesus. You've never laid down your life to Jesus. And it, it by far is the biggest decision you'll ever make because it, it determines eternal destiny heaven or hell and so it's the biggest decision you'll ever ever make and so I get the incredible privilege every every weekend that I teach to give people an opportunity to say yes to Jesus and so if that is your desire today to say yes to Jesus I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me I'm going to ask you to say it aloud and if, if you've already made the decision to follow Jesus, would you pray it aloud? And you can allow this to be a time of recommitment of your own life, and you can join in with those who may be praying for the first time. So if that's your desire, would you pray this prayer with me? Father in heaven, today I thank you for Jesus. And Jesus, I ask you to come into my life and to forgive me of my sin, to heal me of my brokenness, to give me new life, be my Savior and be my Lord. I choose to follow you. I pray this in your name. Amen.